Welcome to Finding Holiness, where we delve into timeless Torah wisdom, revealing the sacred in everyday moments. Join us on a journey to elevate your spirituality and discover holiness in every aspect of life. I'm your host, Rabbi David Kadosh, and together, let's embark on a path of spiritual exploration. I hope you enjoy this next episode. All right, Erev Tov, everyone. Hope you're doing okay. We are live again tonight, Thursday night, Parashat Shavua. We are wingless. Uh, who's in charge? Who's in charge here? I don't know who's in charge, but we we are. I don't know. Um, you know, Hashem Hashem decides, I guess. Well, mind you, that's going to be our topic tonight. Um, well, so, so, someone's going to take care of wings. Now. Okay, we'll see. We're going to get wings next week, but that's Hashem. We're supposed to have wings tonight, but we don't have wings tonight. Um, okay, Parashat Vayetze. Welcome everybody who's here live in person. Welcome everybody who's listening live on YouTube and Facebook, and those listening on the podcast, Beruchim Abayim. Parashat Vayetze is another classic of the Parashiyot of Bereshit, um, one that is very difficult to read for a Baal um, It's uh, but it contains so much, uh, so much information. It's Yaakov Avinu and his uh, amazing, incredible dream uh, promised by Hashem that he's going to protect him, that he's going to provide for him. Um, he has to leave Eretz Yisrael, and uh, he goes to his uh, his uncle, his uncle Lavan. There he marries Leah, which should have been Rachel, but of course because uh, Lavan had other things in, in mind. So Leah gets married first to Yaakov, and then Rachel, after years and years of hard labor and work, but uh, the the inyan of the parasha, no question, is the birth of the twelve shevatim, the twelve tribes. This is Bnei Israel, literally the children of Israel, and uh, the future of of Klal Israel as we know it. There's uh, a lot of amazing things in the in the parasha to talk about. I want to focus on on a theme that we have spoken in the past many times, but it's always good to review this every so often because it's something that applies to us every single day, every single moment of our day, in fact. The Chachamim tell us in Pirkei Avot, Metsuda perusa al kol hayim, that there is a trap, Metsuda is a trap, that is spread out before all the people. And what is this trap? This trap is... This trap, according to many, is the, is the Yetzirah. You have a Yetzirah that goes out and tries to trap all the people in terms of their sins. But the Baal Shem Tov actually says differently. He says this Metsuda is a trap when we pursuit our Parnasa, when we pursuit our uh, sustenance. And uh, just like when I go fishing, I take uh, a worm and I attach it to the hook, uh, or I put uh, to catch the fish, and I toss, and I toss, uh, I cast a rod to catch the fish, catch the fish. Um, so there's bait to catch animals. The quest for parnasa also um, captures many people in a trap, and that distances themselves from Hashem. And that trap actually comes in in many forms, and tonight we're going to discuss some of them. One aspect of this trap is geneva. Is stealing. The Gemara says, and we've quoted this in um, in our Mesilat Yisharim class on Shabbat afternoon. Rubam begazel, miutam be'arayot, ve'kulam be'avak lashon hara. Most people sin with theft. Some few people with arayot, illicit relations, and everybody with the dust of lashon hara. So, what does it mean? Most people sin sin with theft. Well, I, I don't get it. I don't go around pickpocketing people. I don't go around, you know, uh, uh, cheating, uh, you know, my friend. Like, it's just most people look at themselves like, I, I'm okay. Like, I, I don't think I'm stealing. I don't think I'm being over and over. So, Messiah Shalim recognizes this and he says, you're right. Most people don't actually steal. Most people don't go into someone's backpack and take something out of their, out of their bag. Uh, but most people experience a taste of theft in their business. Uh, when they're more when they start allowing things that they think they're allowed to allow, 
Um, they're permitted to cut corners, per permitted to charge more because they think they, they, they can, and they don't realize that those leniencies fall under the uh, umbrella of, uh, of Geneva. Um, I, I, I'm not, you know, it's, it's funny, I'm, I'm not going to, no, no one knows who's behind this screen. So, but, but it's funny, but I did hear something yesterday on the, on the radio on how the government here in Ontario wants to, um, I guess, uh, legislate something to, uh, to make car insurance something that is much more, you know, I guess equal. And because supposedly you, you could go to uh, London, Ontario and pay uh, $1,300 for a premium. For, and the exact same car, exact same case in Brampton is like thirty six hundred dollars, right? So, so how do you how do you explain that? How do you explain that? <laughs> they take to a commission, right? Or it could be just taking advantage of the public, right? That's what it is. So, people fall under the, the umbrella of Geneva. To them, they're saying, "Oh, it's business," but but maybe it's not. Maybe there, there's there's more to it. Um, so, Akados Baruch Hu, Gemara says. Tells the the Rishayim, it's not just enough that you steal, but you also make me. You're forcing me. You're obligating me to return what was stolen to the rightful owner. If you take what is not yours, then what is yours will be taken away from you. In Parashat Kedoshim, there is the many mitzvot in Parashat Kedoshim. A lot of mitzvot between man and his fellow. And uh, two of them that are mentioned are um, the mitzvot that, that apply to a man in his field, his responsibility to leave certain uh, grain for, for, the, for the poor person. Uh, leket and pe'ah. Pe'ah is that every Jew who owns a land and is, and is har about to harvest his crop, he has the obligation to leave the corners of his field for the poor people. And then you have leket. Leket is that if you're harvesting and one or two stocks of grain fall, your obligation is to leave it for the poor people. But if it's more than that, then you can take it for yourself. And the Pasuk says, the Pasuk ends with, Ani Hashem Elokechem, I am Hashem your God. And Rashi there says, What's the mean? why do I need to end the Pasuk with Ani Hashem Elokechem? What is the reason? Um, so he, he focuses on the word Elokechem, which is Elokim, which is a name of Hashem that connotes strict justice. Like, and Rashi there says, Dayan lehi para. I, in these situations, I am a judge to pay back. And I'm only going to pay back with souls, meaning a very, very strong punishment for a person that thinks that he can outsmart God. Right? Because if you think about it, no one's looking. I harvest, I drop a couple of stocks, nobody's here, I can just go pick it up, and I walk back to my house. And if I can cut my cor the corners of my field, and someone I can say, oh, the poor people already came. So, Ani Hashem Lokechem says, God is a judge to pay back. You think you can steal from the poor people? I'm going to make sure that I'm going to take it from you, and I'm going to take it from you, which is very, very strong, with, with, with souls. Now, what does this mean? A lot of mefarshim on this because you know a, a poor person is considered like he's met, like he's a per, like he, he he's dead because he relies on other people. He's not self sufficient on his own, and uh, and therefore you are you are you are preventing that. You're preventing him from becoming from having some sort of sustenance. So, you know, from you're preventing him from uh, uh, uplifting himself out of that state of met, and uh, so maybe Akados Baruch has to pay you back for that. The Chafetz Chaim says. Whoever steals is a rasha, and he's a fool, because his theft doesn't grant him anything more that was decreed for him on Rosh Hashanah. So whatever he gained from the theft is just going to be taken away from him and returned to his, 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 the rightful owner. Says the Chavetz Chaim, we see this in this week's Perasha, where Lavan stole from Yaakov many times when he was working for him. Ve'achelifet maskurti, he changed my salary tens of times. Rashi says like hundred times he changed my salary. Imagine you go to a job and your, your salary changes hundred uh, hundred times. Now Lavan didn't gain from it. Everything he stole was returned to Yaakov. 
זה פסוק שז. וראה כל העתודים העולים על הצאן, עקודים נקודים וורודים. יעקב says, saw in his dream that, that מלאכים were carrying away לבן's sheep and bringing them into Yaakov's territory. How can מלאכים do that? Isn't it theft? Hashem explained to Yaakov, כי ראיתי את כל אשר לבן עושה לך. I saw everything that לבן did to you. I saw how he cheated you. I saw how he stole from you. I saw how he tricked you, and therefore I'm now going to return it all to you. And this happened over and over again. After working seven years for Rachel, Lavan gave Yaakov Leah and made him work another seven years for Rachel. And uh, Rashi writes that Yaakov worked the second set of years as honestly as he did the first seven set of years, although he was tricked into them. Right? You might think, this guy just, this guy just screwed me over. He, uh, you know, he gave me the wrong woman. I have every right. Okay, to just do nothing for seven years. I'll pretend to work. I'll do the, the, the minimal labor required just so that I can marry Rachel. But no, it was honest work. Because if you're working and you're not honest as an employee, then you're still also liable for theft. But that honesty of Yaakov was something that was impeccable. Towards the end of the, uh, the parasha, Yaakov expressed that he worked um, honestly for Lavan for 20 years. If a sheep was stolen, if a sheep was killed by a wolf, by a wolf by a wild animal, Yaakov would repay him with his own money. Uh, he guarded over the sheep in the heat. He guarded over the sheep at cold at night. Uh, and Hashem repaid him for that honesty because Yaakov became very wealthy. Now, there are times where stealing would be allowed. Uh, how is stealing allowed? So, it says to Katsuka Rebbe, very famously, he says that we are obligated to be kovea itim la Torah where the, we have to set aside times for Torah study. And the translation of kovea is, can also mean to steal, to, to grab. And uh, the, the person, the Katsuka Rebbe says, a person needs to steal time from his busy day and his busy schedule to study Torah. Because the pursuit of parnasa, like we started the class with, is a metzuda perusa. It's a trap that catches the people. Um, and, and one dominant aspect of that trap is that when the obligation of earning a living and, and parnasat doesn't leave people with the time of Torah and Tefillah. In fact, the, the Bat Ayn, who's a great Hasidic tzaddik, is, is he was, I think this week on Yud Bet Kislev, he says that the word perusa, which, which means spread out, betuda perusa, a spread out trap, also can be translated as a loaf of bread. Um, and uh, like a uh, perusa, so there's a trap of bread, the trap of parnasa, it, it passes before everybody. Uh, and the, he also writes that the pursuit of, of parnasa and sustenance is a trap. People become completely immersed in their work, and and they don't even have time for clarity of mind. They don't have time for avodat Hashem. They don't have time to learn anything, to listen even to a little class. Um, but when one contemplates that Hashem sustains the entire world with his kindness, and he knows that I don't, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not wise, but Hashem is still going to give me the parnasan that I need, um, then you'll find time for Torah and mitzvot. Uh, if, 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 he will, if, he th- if he says, I'm going to um, devote every second of my day to my, my business, then you don't have what you need in order to maintain a certain level of bitachon, and you're not going to find time for anything. You know, to... You know, Toronto, um, actually, uh, I, I hear from many people, and I, I kind of see where they're getting this from. Toronto seems to have a bad rap. There's a bad, bad reputation about the city and the, 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 the insistence of working and working and working. Um, and, and there's, no, there's no breaks. One, one, one thing you see in the European culture is this concept of time for, time for yourself, right? You'll, you'll work till 2 o'clock. And you'll take a little break for two, three hours, and you'll come back to work to finish off your day, okay? And, you know, in, in, in Europe, you see this concept of people going out, and people, uh, cafes, and they're full. And here, in, you know, in our society, it's just work, work, work. It gets dark, and by the time you come home, you're tired, and, and stuff like this. That's a reputation that, that some of us have now. Uh, who, there's, I'm sure there's other reasons why that's the case. But, okay, the have deal. Okay, the Europeans have find their two to three hours to go out to a coffee shop, so we need to find our two to three hours uh, to, to, to learn some Torah, to engage in, in holy business. Um, if a person wouldn't run after their parnasa, 
the Parnassah would run after him. Why? Because Hashem decided on Rosh Hashanah whether you're going to be poor or whether you're going to be wealthy, according to Hashem's wisdom and your individual needs. So everything is decreed. Everything is decreed on Rosh Hashanah, except whether you're going to be a tzaddik or a rasha, because that's your own free will. You you can you get to choose whether you want to be a tzaddik or you want to be, God forbid, a rasha. But it's decreed how much furniture you're going to have in your utensils and, and your food and your clothing. Uh, you, you're not going to get more. You're not going to get less. You're going to get exactly. So the parnasah that is destined for you is going to run after you. And therefore, a person can allow himself time for avodat Hashem, and it's not going to detract from his parnasah. Now, our obligation, our obligation to do hishtadlut. Hishtadlut is, is what I need to do. I gotta get I gotta get a job or I gotta work to get my partner. That's our Hishad Lut. That also creates another trap. Because it causes people to think, this is a big chidus here by Rabbi Eli, uh, Eli Melch Bitterman. He says the Hishad Lut cause, causes a trap because it makes you think that Parnasa comes from the Hishad Lut and doesn't come from Hashem himself. It's an amazing story said over by Rabbi uh, Rabbi Usher Weiss. It was a a young, uh, young man, I guess, a uh, family in Manchester, uh, in Manchester, England. And uh, he devoted his time completely to, to studying Torah. Sometimes opportunities for Parnassah came up, and he would turn them down. I just want to learn Torah, a simple man. He didn't want to be involved with Parnassah. And his neighbors would always wonder, how does this guy even survive? Like, how does it work? He, you know, it goes through hard times, inflation, deflation, you name it, everything. How does this guy do it? But Hashem always helps him in the end. After his thirteenth child was born, he was um, he was summoned to court. He got a letter in the mail. He was please come to this courthouse on this day at this time. And it had something to do with a man named John Klabari. John Klabari. Now, what the, what's going on over here? I don't know, court. I don't even know who this guy is. He writes a letter back to the court and he says, uh, "I think I got the wrong guy. Sorry, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not coming. I want to stay and learn my my daf yomi. I don't even know this person. It's got to be a mistake." So a court replied, listen, it's about an inheritance, and you have to come to court. Inheritance, come to court. So he thought it was a waste of, a waste of time. But in court, he find out, found out who this guy John Klobari is. John Klobari died without children, and he left over half a million pounds to the largest family in Manchester. And with 13 children, he was the largest family in Manchester, and received the money. And so on one hand, you might say that this man's approach was extreme, right? And most Gedulim tell us, you have to do your Ishadut. You have to go out, you got to work. Uh, Ishadut creates the vessel for the Parnasa uh, that Hashem wants to give us. But the story, okay, is, is a reminder that Hashem is the one that, that gives the Parnasa. Once it was a Rav who took a loan from a, a Gemach uh, to help him marry off one of his children. Uh, and soon he left after the gemach. He has uh, some money in his hands. Okay, somebody ambushed him and stole all the money, right? And uh, and right at that moment, he said, well, "I'm not taking any more loans." So one of the one of his friends, another rabbi, went up to him and goes, "Yeah, but you have to do your hishadlut. You have to do your hishadlut. If, if loans is what it is, that's your hishadlut." So he answered. He said, "Hashem can help without hishadlut, but ha- ha- but Hashem commanded us to make hishadlut. But I see that my hishadlut doesn't help because every time I go try to do something, it doesn't work." So I, my, my next option is to rely on emuna and bitachon. And that's why Hashem is going to help me. And in fact, there, this, this little story is supported by a Gemara in the Talmud Yerushalmi. The, the, the Gemara relates of Rabbi Yanai. Uh, was, he was afraid of snakes. So he placed four beds, uh, the four bed posts, the four legs of his bed into buckets of water. And this was a, a way to deter the snakes and make them not come on his bed in the middle of the night. Uh, yes, that's what they worried about back then, snakes. So one day he woke up and there was a snake in his bed. And uh, so the so snake found a way to bypass the water. And from then on, he said, I'm not going to use the buckets of water anymore. I'm just going to trust in Hashem. Right? So again, so what, what, it, 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 so what happened? It must be that he saw that the Hishtadut wasn't working. So if, my, if the Hishtadut's not working, I have to go directly to Hashem. So says the Pasuk in this week's Berasha, Yaakov went to sleep on the, on the holy mountain, 
ויקח מאבני המקום וישם מרעשותיו וישכב במקום ההוא. But Yaakov went and he lay down, he took from the stones of the place, he put them around his head and he slept in that place. So Rashi says, very famous, that he laid the stones in a semicircle around his head because he was afraid of the wild animals. Um, <clears throat> and the stones started arguing. One of them said, the Sadiq should place his head on me. And the other stone said, no, I want to be the one, I want to be the pillow. No, I want to be the pillow. And everyone who wanted to be the pillow. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Rashi says, immediately combined all the stones, So it changed from Avneh HaMakom to Even, to singular, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu made all these stones into, into one. Look at the Chidush of the Maram Shik, Zechet Tzadik Libracha. He says that the Avanim, the stones, represents the Avne Yesod of our, of our lives, of our Parnasa, the foundations of our Parnasa. There are two foundations. Hishtadlut, which means doing what I have to do, to, like we said, working, get a job, investment, whatever it is, and bitachon. Bitachon is full trust in God. The stones were arguing with each other. The foundation of Hishtadlut said that I am the means to the Parnassah. And the foundation of bitachon says, no, I'm the means for the Parnassah. So what's the truth? HaKadosh Baruch Hu took the smaller stones and he forged them into one, one big rock, says the Maram Sheik. And means HaKadosh Baruch Hu took the two foundations, the Hishtadlut and the Bitahon, and he showed them that they function together in unison. So we do Hishtadlut for three we- reasons. One, it's everyone's obligation to do Hishtadlut. B, Hashem wants us to make Hishtadlut to create a test, uh, uh, an, an illusion uh, that, that Parnassah comes from people's work, but it really is not. And C, Hashem sends us the bounty and the sustenance through the vessel of Hishtadlut. Hishtadlut is the channel, but not the origin of the Parnassah. So Hishtadlut is very necessary, but simultaneously we have to really believe that Parnassah comes from Hashem. And if you look in this week's parasha, again, you see many, many times this concept of Hishtadlut. Yaakov Avinu, like we said, working to marry his wives and afterwards gets a Parnassah. That's examples of Hishtadlut. You have the Parasha of the Dudaim, yeah, of the uh, of where the Sephorno explains these flowers, these plants were mesugal to have children, and therefore Rachel asked Leah for these flowers, these Dudaim, because she hoped that by by uh, making some sort of tea with these flowers, okay, that she would help, it would help bear bear, bear children. Um, more than that, we see Rach, Rachel give Yaakov her maidservant Bilha when she could, when she was barren, so that. Uh, hoping that in merit of this chesed, and this hishtadlut, that she too would have a child. Uh, the Torah tells us about their hishtadlut, because Hashem desires it, He wants it. The Sephorna writes that, that Hashem desired the hishtadlut of the imahot, bringing the, the maidservants into their homes, and, the, and therefore this cause, He wanted to hear the tefilot of the tzaddikim. It's proper for the tzaddik to, to run the, nas- the, the, the normal channels to do the natural hishadut that's in their ability to attain their needs, but then to pray. HaKadosh Baruch Hu desires the tefillot of, of the tzaddikim. And that's really, in essence, what, it, what it's all about. It's turning our eyes to HaKadosh Baruch Hu whenever we can. The, the opening Aliyah says, where Hashem tells Yaakov, I want, you, I want you to know that your children are going to be like the dust of the earth, and they will expand westward, eastward, northward, and southward. It says the Kli Yaakov, a, a, big, a big novelty. And he says, is, means, alludes to that the Jewish nation will descend to the lowest levels. It's not, it's, it's, this, is what's going, this is what's going to happen. Almost like we were talking about before. It seems like the whole world seems is anti uh, anti Jew right now. The Jews are going to be at the at the bottom of the world. Life is going to become unbearable. Everywhere you look, you're going to see why why uh, how can I live in this place? It just gets worse and worse and worse. And then they're going to turn their eyes to Hakadosh Baruch Hu because that's their last resort. And Hashem is going to raise them to the highest levels. First, you're going to be kafar aret, and then it's going to be uparatsa yama vaked Then you're going to have the wealth. Then you're gonna have success because Hashem's success, uh, the Bnei Yisrael success comes when we turn our eyes to Hashem. And generally, it's unfortunate, but people 
will turn to Hashem after they feel they run out of all other options uh, to save themselves. The Kli Akar, um, you know, s- says this, this same idea in his Perush, that salvation, Yeshua, comes when the Jewish people are at the very lowest level, so all concept of Hanukkah as well, when it's in the darkest days of the year, that's when we make the light, that's when the light shines the brightest, and we have uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu coming to our Yeshua when the when when the 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 Chashmonaim and the Jews that are living in Yavan literally faced the wor- the worst type of Jewish life. Their lives weren't threatened, but their Jew- Judaism was threatened. Um, you know, no no Shabbat, no Rosh Chodesh, no holidays, uh, no Brit Milah. Everything that makes us a Jew, they couldn't practice. And the, 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 for them, it was like my life my life's not worth living. What's the whole point if I can't practice what I what I love? And through that darkness came the, the, the Yeshua. Kishacha le'afar nafshenu kuma azrat alanu. When we fall to the earth, says David HaMelech, that's when Hashem saves us. And the explanation is as long as pe- people aren't at the lowest level, they say to themselves, okay, I still got a way out, I still can do this, yeah, I can save myself with, with a little bit more hishtadlut, but when they see that the hishtadlut doesn't help, then they place the trust in Hashem. That's when they call out to, to God, when, and then God will raise them to the highest levels possible. Um, the Brisker Rav would, was very famous in saying the following quote, and he says, um, I don't understand, I don't understand how, well, how the wealthy people have Parnassah. That's what he would famously say. I don't understand how the wealthy people have Parnassah. He says, I understand how the poor people have Parnassah. They realize they can't manage on their own. So... I gotta pray to Hashem. I have to put my trust in Hashem. But the wealthy people have a lot of money, and they think that they can manage on their own. So even when they pray, they don't feel that they need to ask for parnasah when they're worth millions of dollars or billions of dollars. So he asked, "How do they have parnasah?" And he said, "I don't have an answer to this question. I don't have an answer to this question." Uh, there was a Rebbe of uh, Sokolov said that based on a a midrash in Kohelet, that uh, very simple, whoever has 100 wants 200. Whoever has 200 wants 400. Meaning, <coughs> e- even the wealthy want more, or think that they don't have enough, and therefore they are forced to pray. And that's, that's the end of the question. Right? The wealthy f- also feel that they lack, and they turn their eyes to Hashem to, uh, to help them. There was once um, two competing farmers, incredible story, um, with two different farms, and they were about to harvest their wheat and sell the grain for matzot, for Pesach. Um, and one of them came to the Gadol Ador at the time in the, in the, in, uh, in, in the area they lived, uh, Rabbi Yaakov Berdugo. Rabbi Yaakov Berdugo. And he said to him, I'm going to harvest his grain, and I want the rabbi to give me a beracha that I should be a success. And Rabbi Yaakov Berdugo, he blessed him, gave him a bracha. The other farmer comes to Rabbi Yaakov, and he says, I'm about to harvest the grain, and I want you to give, you, I, I want you to give me a bracha for success. But Rabbi Yaakov didn't give him a bracha. He didn't give him a bracha. Now the guy who didn't get the bracha, he comes home, and he's depressed. Wife says, what's going on? The rabbi didn't give me a bracha. And you know, this is going to be a disaster. The rabbi doesn't give me a blessing. He didn't want to harvest a crop. He figured the crop wasn't blessed. It's only going to bring me heartache. But the family said, ah, come on, yalla, don't want, don't who cares where the rabbi go, go, harvest your crop, harvest your crop. So he did. And indeed, there was no blessing in the crop. Whoever bought the grains didn't enjoy them. One person bought uh, wheat kernels and then it rained on, them, on the wheat kernels and rendered the wheat unfit for Pesach. Another one, it rained while they were baking matzot. This was a city that was you know, meticulous on gibrux, which is any any form of moisture, um, you know, could, uh, or posel, the, the, everything, even from the time, that, even when they're in a, a, still in their shell. So he wasn't, he weren't able to use matzot, couldn't make money. Whoever bought the wheat didn't enjoy them, it wasn't tasty, you name it, no beracha whatsoever in this wheat. So Rabbi Yaakov called over the farmer who was having this bad mazal. He says, tell me, do you know why this is happening? You know why? Uh, why all this? You know, I'm hearing stories. It's all your grain, and no one's liking it. And it's, uh, you know, this guy had this, this thing with the water, and he can't sell matzot, can't eat the matzot. It's not natural that everybody who buys your grain is, ha- is facing difficulties. So the farmer admitted to the reason, and he said, 
you know, before I sold them, it rained on the wheat kernels, but I dragged them up and I didn't want, uh, and I didn't tell anybody what happened. So basically Hashem protected the whole Jewish community um, and whoever purchased wheat from him didn't, uh, didn't end up eating from his crop. Uh, um, the, so the rab says, okay, you have an obligation to return the money to the people that bought, um, that bought wheat from you, to whoever, to whoever bought from you. She said, okay, the, rabbi, the farmer said, okay. But the farmer looks at the rabbi and he says, why didn't the rabbi bless me? When you gave the other guy a blessing, you gave my competitor a beracha, you didn't give me a beracha. Why not? Maybe this wouldn't have happened if I would have just received a beracha from the rabbi. So what did Rabbi, Rabbi Yaakov Verdugo respond? Unbelievable. He says, the other farmer, when he came to me to ask for a beracha, he started with the words, Im Hashem, if God wants. He mentioned Hashem's name. Who is the source of beracha? God. And that's why I blessed him. I blessed him, he was successful. You didn't mention Hashem's name, which implies that you think you're in charge. When you think you're in charge, this is your results. This is why this is what happened to you. Incredible, in, in, incredible story. Um, you know, you think you think about it. You know, again, approaching the holiday of Hanukkah, and uh, the, the the toy we all play with as kids is the dreidel. And uh, how does the dreidel stand? How does the dreidel spin? Sorry, how does it spin? There's no legs. There's no legs. How does it spin? It spins because there's someone spinning it from above. There's someone who is in charge from above. It doesn't stand by its own strength. It's, it's, it's able to spin because there's the strength of the person who spins it. So we cannot manage on our own. We are the bottom of the dreidel. Everything we do comes from our Kadosh Baruch Hu who gives us the strength from above. When the dreidel is spinning, no one can read the letters. You have no idea. It's just spinning. It's fast. But the moment it stops and it falls, then you can see, Nes Kadol, Ayasham, Nun, Hei, Gimel, Shin, a great miracle happened there. People are very, so what's the nimshal? When, when life's moving fast and people are very busy, uh, you don't recognize the miracles that Hashem perform, performs for you. It's just one big spin. But when everything settles down, when you get a chance to stop, breathe, and concentrate for a moment, and look around you, that's when you recognize the, the miracles that Hashem performs, uh, performs for you. In Migilat Esther, it says, that Esther was beautiful. And the first letters of Yefet Toar Retovat Mare spells Yatom. Esther was a Yatom. She was an orphan. Um, but what's the idea here? What's, what's the Rokeach trying to tell me? I tell me that orphans, more than anybody else, turned their eyes to God. Um, and in that merit, Hashem helped Esther constantly. The Torah tells us, Don't cause any distress or suffering to a widow or to an orphan. And the Rabbeinu Bechaye explains, because the widows and the orphans are weak. No one helps them. They're by themselves. And therefore, they don't trust in human beings. They don't think that the human being is going to be able to, to assist them. Uh, only Akados Baruch Hu. And that's why they're protected more than everybody else. If he shouts to me, then I'm going to listen to his shouts. So, you know, if you cause pain and harm to an orphan, you're going to get it. You're going to get it from me because I hear the voice of the orphan more than, more than any, any other voice. So like we said before, a person has to make his ishtadlut for parnasa, but the primary ishtadlut is tefillah and to trust in Hashem because when a person turns to Hashem, that's when Hashem helps. You know, if you actually look at the request that Yaakov Avinu made in the, in the beginning of the parasha, the promise, the deal, the pact he made with God, that Hashem should be with me, guard him, protect him, return him in peace to his father's home. Hashem promised him that it would be so. But there's one thing that Yaakov asked that Hashem didn't guarantee. And that, 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 that the request would be fulfilled. Yaakov requested that Hashem didn't promise him. Why didn't he promise him? Because if Hashem says, if I promise Yaakov Parnasa, then when he's going to come ask something for me? When he's going to come to ask me? If I promise it to him, he'll leave me alone. It's like the, what I said last week in Beit Knesset, 
you know, the nimshah with the, the parents and the, and the, the three ways that a parent can give his child money, right? You have, uh, you know, one, whenever, on a need-to-be basis, you, you need money, you call mom and dad, or you have a monthly allowance, stipend, or you have the credit card. The credit card is the worst. The credit card is, take, leave me alone, I don't want to hear from you. Versus the need to be is the best because you're always in connection with Akados Baruch Hu. Same idea here. Hashem wanted Yaakov to feel totally dependent on Akados Baruch Hu because if he knew that he was always going to have food and clothing and protection, he's not going to need to feel the need to attach himself to Hashem. Lavan tells Yaakov, Nokva secharecha alai ve'etena. State your wages and I will pay it. Tell me what you want, Yaakov. Tell me, what's your salary? Vayomer, Yaakov says, don't give me anything. And he just went on to request the speckled, the spotted, the, 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 the brown striped sheep that are going to be born, that's going to be belong to him. What's going on in here? He's offering you money. He's, giving, he's offering you $100,000 a year salary. Okay? Why are you turned down for? Why, why are you going for the, the, the sheep and the... Which, by the way, like almost there were so few of them, that never exists. Yaakov had to go through this whole maneuver with the with the rods and sticking them in the water, and that's a whole different story for another time. A lot of deep Kabbalistic concepts going on over there. Um, but take the money, take the fixed wage. So the benefit of the fixed wage is that it's a secure income. The advantage of the unfixed salary, one that depends on a lot of different variables, is that there's potential to really increase your wealth more. Right? Like the businessmen, if you're really good at what you do and you know how to pull the right strings, you can make a lot more money than a person that has a fix, the fixed salary. But on the other hand, if you don't know what you're doing, you might not make anything at all. You might earn zero. So what do you do? But the primary benefit of the unfixed salary is that it forces a person to place his trust in Hashem. Yaakov preferred a non-fixed income because he wanted to place his trust in Hashem alone. Yaakov says, I don't want a $100,000 salary. I don't want a fixed income. I want my parnasat to be derech mikre. By chance. The goodness of Hashem is what I deserve. Hashem's kindness is He prepares for me. I, that's what I want. And because he placed his trust in Hashem, he experienced immense uh, success. In Eretz Israel, actually, a pay stub in Hebrew is called a tlus, tlus maskoret, to pay stub. What does telush mean? <coughs> telush means detached. Something that's talush means d- detached. Because when a person receives a set wage, it's like he's detached from, from Hashem because he relies on that wage. You know, he feels like he's dependent of God. Okay, obviously, you know, you know, if you have a good opportunity, you know, I'm not saying that you know, everyone should go in business and not take a set wage. Okay? But... Um, you know, we're just telling people that no matter what type of parnasa that you have, you turn, turn your eyes to Hashem, it's Hashem who provides the sustenance. Maybe this is what, what the Haggadah meant um, when we recite, uh, Lavan bikesh la'akor et hakol, that Lavan wanted to uproot Yaakov Havinu, everything. Um, from, he wanted to uproot Yaakov from Hashem, from everything that he, that he had in his life. He tried to give Yaakov a set salary, then Yaakov would not feel that his parnasa came from uh, from God. In fact, Yaakov would say, "Ah, my parnasa, yeah, Lavan is my employer. My parnasa comes from Lavan." But he didn't want that. He wanted a parnasa that would cause him to turn his eyes to Hashem to help him constantly. So as we as we uh, uh, close a, another uh, year, a fiscal year coming down in the end of December, so that many businesses uh, and we, we we start measuring the numbers and looking. How much did I make? How much did I lose? Am I in the black? Am I in the red? Um, you know, or, or, or should I ask for a raise? Should I not ask for a raise? A lot of people went through difficult times the last few years. We spoke about this many times. You know, no one expected this type of uh, increased prices in foods and gas and clothing and everything. And uh, the person who got the raise uh, two years ago says, ah, oh, I negotiated an amazing contract. Little does he know that this, uh, his raise is, is peanuts compared to What's happening in the world? And now he's looking back and he's saying, oh, I didn't negotiate such a really good contract. I'm really losing out over here, right? Because I'm, I'm falling behind the rest of, of society. But, but, that's the time where we have to remember, all I can do is my hishtadlut. That's all I can do is my hishtadlut. And, and, and if it comes to the point that my hishtadlut is not working enough to what I need, 
then there's only one other solution, which is to look to Hashem. Like Shalut is just the corridor. It's just the pipeline that come, that a person has to do. But in reality, it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu who provides <coughs> the Parnassah. And that's the idea. It's taking those two Yesodeh, uh, of, of, of Yesod, those two found, rock foundations, putting them together because they are indeed one. Now it's the main lesson, one of the major, major themes of this week's Pera Hashem is that Hashem, we should find that strength to always look up to Shamaim when we need to. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu should provide us with sustenance, Berachah, Shefa, Amen Kinyasun. Have a wonderful night, everybody. <laughs>